very much. Our next speaker has a pretty interesting presentation on the role of fish as sources and vectors of bacteria, as well as the influence of bat colonies on indicator bacterial levels. Uh, Dr. George Gienz from the Environmental Institute of Houston at the University of Houston Clear Lake. Thank you. Apologize for late arrival, but Houston got me again. Uh, this is actually two presentations and it's actually one presentation and, and another one is Dr. Brinkmeyer who's our colleague of mine who's co-author of uh, part of the study on bats and so we'll see how it goes. I'm probably have to skip through a few things here to keep us on time but uh, they were two separate studies but uh, they asked for me to present both of them so I'm going to see how it works out. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, Dr. Brinkmeyer was a co-author of the uh, bat colony study, and uh, Jenny uh, Rass is, was involved with both of them, and plus a multitude of folks who helped collect data. Um, anyway, um, as all you guys know, you know, there's a lot of different sources of bacteria, and some of them that we've looked at with various tools and various approaches over the years. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a couple of, of sources that I guess the folks in Houston area in Harris County, the locals, uh, were kind of concerned with that had been looked at very closely. And, and uh, one was fish, okay? And you know, those are cold-blooded vertebrates and conventional wisdom is they're not really anything to be concerned with. And, and another one was bats, uh, uh, make some free tail bats, which are form you know, colonies, roosting areas underneath a lot of urban bridges, including up here in Austin. And so I'm going to talk about both, try to kind of skip over a few things so we can stay on track. Uh, but it was a very interesting study. Uh, I'm a fisheries biologist, water quality type person by training and experience. And uh, now I didn't know a lot about bats when I first got started, but it was fun learning about them. And I co coordinated a lot with parks and wildlife and so forth. Uh, but anyway, uh, again, we'll talk about the fish study and then the bat study. Uh, a little bit about the fish study um, and uh, in terms of what we did, there's a lab and a field component. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about both. One, the aquarium study uh, really was uh, not too exciting, but we'll present the results anyway. Uh, well, before, before I get started, this is uh, Wall Street Bridge. We'll get back to the uh, uh, to the bat study at the end here, but we did work early in the morning and late in the afternoon, prior to daylight, and right before uh, dark or in the late afternoon, uh, because bats have diel behavior, of course, they're active at night, and they roost during the daytime. And you would think that probably affects, you know, how much stuff to put in the water. Uh, but first, let's talk about fish. Well, a lot of different kinds of fish, they all feed differently, they have, they've got different diets, and, uh, and so when we decided to do this study, we, we wanted to make sure we looked at different trophic levels, uh, because we figured that the, that might have an effect, because fish feed at different locations, you know, herbivores may be, you know, feeding off rocks versus carnivores chasing things down in the water column, and maybe that has an effect on how much bacteria they may or may not be picking up. And it may be affecting, you know, their, their own, own ecology in terms of the things that might be growing in their gut. Uh, and so, uh, but a little bit of background information. We did a little bit of a literature s survey, and it was very interesting. A lot of information in the, in the aquaculture industry, as well as studies that have been done around the, the world in terms of looking at cold-blooded vertebrates. And uh, this is uh, this is a summary of various studies. Uh, this is a study that was done in the early 2000s where they looked at various vertebrates, and uh, in terms of the isolates or samples they they uh, took from various groups of uh, vertebrates, they found that about 10% of the fish, they were able to isolate E. coli. You know, were they from the fish or were they picking it up somewhere in the water column? I don't know. Uh, there also seems to be some type, and this is this for terrestrial vertebrates, there does seem to be some type of a influence in terms of their feeding habits of the particular vertebrate in terms of how frequently you pick up E. coli isolates. Um, but there, there is, based on literature, uh, a large population of bacteria. You, 
no surprise, and fish guts, very high levels of bacteria. Uh, these are just you know general numbers, not any specific group. Uh, back in 1995, here in Texas, uh, Davis, Ernst Davis, who's now no longer with us, uh, did some work. He looked at fecal coliforms. He also isolated E. coli from catfish farms up here when they're having all these problems with the Edwards Aquifer and diverting all that water for the catfish farm that some of you may know about. Um, and there's been some studies in South America and elsewhere where they have isolated E. coli from fish guts. Um, and there's work that was done up in the Great Lakes where they actually found E. coli as well. It turns out though when they did the genetic work it looked like it was actually uh, originated from waterfowl. Okay, so they had it, but it didn't look like it was theirs. Um, there was some work that was done uh, looking at uh, both pelagic and benthic fish. Uh, they noticed that there was the benthic organisms were harboring fecal coliforms, uh, but not significantly different from the pelagic fish. Of all those that did harbor it, though, they found that E. coli in the benthic fish had, had, a, had it at a rate that was about 10 times higher than the pelagic fish. Uh, again, about 65% of the sources were identified to other organisms. Uh, they found fecal coliforms just about every species examined, but not necessarily in every fish examined. Okay, so in every species, but not always in this, all fish that they looked at. Uh, and it wasn't dominated by a single strain. They concluded that fish may acquire these through their feeding on the water column. They didn't think they were something you know, unique to fish. Okay, what happened there? All right, so we wanted to see if wild caught fish uh, from Harris County uh, waterways uh, had uh, in their fecal material E. coli. Okay, uh, the other thing we wanted to do is we were doing our laboratory study where we had fish and we could isolate them in captivity. Would they generate E. coli bacteria? And using this information, maybe get some idea of what kind of range, possible range of loading might be occurring or being deposited by, by fish out in the wild. Uh, these are the sites that we uh, worked at. Greens Bayou, which is a uh, urban stream, and White Oak Bayou, a lot of wastewater plants, you know, a lot of TMDL work's been done in White Oak Bayou and all these. And Horseman Bayou is just something near our campus, and it was convenient. It's mostly a suburban neighborhood. Uh, and again, typical urban stream, you know, channelized, you know, uh, variety of land uses, a lot of uh, impervious surface. Uh, and these are the target species we were looking at, and we electroshocked them and uh, collected them on site. And we, you know, measured water quality, temperature, you know, connectivity, things like that. Uh, that wasn't a fish we caught, but we thought it was a pretty cool picture. But some of these other. <laughs> Some of these other fish we did, but just to give you an idea, you know, uh, you know, this is alligator garb, spotted bass, you know, some carp, uh, blue channel cats, needlefish. These are some a tilapia. We have a lot of invasive fish in our area, so tilapia was one that we uh, caught, caught, especially down by our school. Uh, again, collected them in the field, euthanized them. Uh, and we extracted their guts in the field. Uh, we then uh, had pre-weighed bottles and we stripped the fecal matter into the uh, pre-weighed bottles so we can look at the difference in weight. Shook it all up back at the lab. Um, Use IDEX method. Uh, then we calculated how much per mil and then looked at how much that is in terms of the original fecal matter. And we also did some sediment sampling at some of these sites too and this, you know, back calculated what it would be per gram of fecal material. Um, and so we wanted to compare size, trophy groups, seasons. We did some non-parametric stats on those differences and some graphical comparisons. And uh, we did see some differences. These are all the species combined in terms of in water. We did some water sampling too. And uh, as we expected, some of our more urban streams, Wide Oak Bayou had fairly elevated concentrations of bacteria. Um, in terms of the in sediment, uh, we found very uh, elevated levels at Wide Oak Bayou and Greens. Horse pin is the one by our school. Okay. Um, in terms of the uh, 
uh, sites in terms of bacteria levels though uh, between sites uh, we didn't see a whole lot of significance we did see one outlier here at Greens but uh, for the most part, uh, the significant differences between uh, sites uh, in fish bacteria were between horse spin body and the two urban sites. That is, the two urban sites, and it's hard to see because, again, this one outlier stretches this out, but I, I can't really change the settings on this non-parametric uh, multiple comparison test. Uh, the two uh, urban streams here were significantly higher than the uh, one bar school, the, the uh, less developed site, and this is all species pooled together. Uh, in terms of water temperature, uh, yeah, we saw a little bit of a relationship between E. coli and water, and but you know, not not nothing to get excited, and we didn't have a whole lot of data points. Um, and let me see here, uh, uh, we didn't have any data for the fall, and this is in terms of per, in sediment. Uh, at each site. Uh, this is again looking at the different sites here, White Oak, Bayou, and the black one here, the black and green one are the more urban streams. Um, generally, horse pen near our school had the lowest amount of bacteria in the sediment. Uh, in terms of uh, seasonal patterns and in terms of uh, 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 fish, uh, concentrations, we saw the highest concentrations uh, in the uh, fall and summer and lowest during the spring. These are all species pooled together. Uh, not very informative here because we had a lot of spread, uh, but it, in terms of a lot of variability, but the highest levels in terms of species we tend to see uh, in terms of green sunfish and uh, warm mouth gallosis. And this is interesting because these are both predators. We thought that would be the other way around. Don't know why, but that's what we found. Um, and that also played out when we pulled together all the predatory fish. They tend to have a little bit higher uh, bacteria level in their fecal ma uh, material uh, in terms of E. coli. Uh, but we didn't see any statistically significant differences between these trophic groups. Almost uh, significance between herbivores and uh, uh, piscivores and invertebrate feeders, but not uh, wasn't high enough, big enough difference. Um, there's been very few fecal production studies in terms of fish, and it was really interesting. I was just looking for a paper that said, how much poop does fish make? And you, 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 well, you know, you think you could get a simple answer. Well, it, it's not simple because there's variables like temperature, how much you're feeding them, you know, how old they are, and so there's not a straight answer. Uh, it varies with diet and temperature. Uh, there's, in addition, there's very few true density estimates of fish in natural waters. You know, people go out and do electroshock and they get catch per unit effort. But, you know, not too many people go out and wrote known a stream anymore and get, you know, standing biomass. And so uh, we really had to uh, look really hard, but we were able to get some estimates. Uh, we did look at some limited wild marine fish data uh, in laboratory fecal production studies uh, based on weight. We looked at some literature values of density of fish in rivers. There was a great paper I found that looked at all the studies that have been done over the various locations and came up with standing crop estimates. Uh, we had our estimates of E. coli per gram feces, and so we just multiply these together, come up with a daily rate of E. coli production, you know, kind of a back of the envelope type thing. And uh, based on our, you know, limited analysis, limited data, of course, uh, we had median loading estimates ranging anywhere from, you know, 900,000, 29 million per hectare of water. You know, we're assuming around, you know, four or five feet, I think. And of course, a little big spread in terms of the uh, means associated with that. And one of them was extremely high. It was like 29 billion, uh, based on if you lined up all the planets, you know. And so uh, they were in the millions, though. It was significant. Um, and so when we put all this together, looking at fish produ production of fecal material, volume of water, some making some assumptions. Again, in some cases. Uh, only the most maximum levels, though, did we see anything that would approach something that would we be concerned with, even though those numbers sound very high, and you start diluting them out, where we've been seeing some exceedance of any kind of criteria. Again, this is very, very rough and just using, you know, a lot, making a lot of assumptions. But again, it's something to think about. 
Uh, let me just go through the aquarium study very quickly uh, because it wasn't too informative. We, we looked at uh, bluegill and channel cat. Uh, we got them from commercial fish farm, put them out in the aquaria, didn't, you know, stock them at different densities, fed them, monitored bacteria levels in there. Just assuming, well, if they're producing their own bacteria, we may will see an accumulation over time. Uh, really never did see anything. Uh, again, we monitored this for two weeks, and this is kind of data we got. Okay, not much. This is you know week one. You know, these are days here. Uh, a couple of them, but nothing to be concerned with. Um, we did though uh, collect fecal material from some of these fish, and they did have fairly high numbers of E. coli. It wasn't showing up in the water sample, so they either were it was too diluted out, or uh, uh, they were dying as soon as it was hitting the water. It wasn't lasting very long. So, okay, so. Um, Based on what we have in, in the literature that we looked at, uh, we can probably conclude, and I would conclude, that at a minimum, fish are definitely transporters of E. coli. They have them in their gut, they're moving around, and unlike water, they can move upstream, sideways, up and down. And so they, they, they present a problem in terms of being a vector or a, a, a vessel that can move things around in a non-passive manner. Um, and again, uh, our, the, the diet doesn't seem to be very important, although there does seem to be a trend. Um, and based on the literature and what we're seeing, it seems to be more correlated with what's available in the sediment. And uh, maybe they're picking it up through the food chain, and that's, you know, bottom grazers, and then maybe the predators are picking it up from them. I don't know. Um, and so uh, they may be indicators of more of a watershed type problem if you're seeing a lot of bacteria. Now one of the things we did is we focused on urban streams. I like to try to do this in rural areas and see what we get there. Um, and so anyway, it was a, a real interesting study that we did and, and it was, uh, we learned a lot and uh, we're, we're hoping we can do some more because I think it's something that we don't really understand well. Uh, and there just seems to be definite seasonal differences and uh, of course, uh, that may be related to the fact that you know a lot of these are warm, supposedly warm-blooded bacteria that can, uh, or thermophilic bacteria that uh, do better in warm temperatures. Um, again, um, like any good scientist, we want to do some more studies, you know, and, and see if uh, one of the things we like to do is get some better standing stock biomasses for all, so we can get some numbers that are a little bit more, uh, we're a little bit more confident about. Um, bat study. Uh, this is a study we did uh, there in, also in the Houston area, and uh, particularly uh, it was focused in um, uh, Buffalo Bayou. Uh, we, had, we looked at some historical monitoring data because there seemed to be some areas where we're getting some spikes and nobody, you know, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and we also did a field study for about a year or so. Um, where we focused on one particular bat colony, the Wall Street Bridge that I showed you earlier. And uh, because folks there in the area felt that there was a potential loading issue. Um, we also did some genetic work with Dr. Brinkmeyer, and that's why she was involved with this, to see if what we were seeing downstream in this colony, could we you know, say anything about it being associated with the, bec the, the uh, bat feces. Uh, well, Mexican free-tailed bats are considered guano bats because they produce a lot of fecal material. So right there, you know, hey, you know, probably a good source there. Uh, and I don't show this here, but uh, and we talk, I heard caught the tail end there about people sampling fecal material. There was just like bucket loads of fecal pellets underneath the bridge. And what was sad is that there we'd find a lot of street people sleeping underneath these bridges with their mouths open, looking up. And so, <laughs> and so, uh, but there was this large. I mean, you get shovels and pick this stuff up. Of course, we sample mostly in dry periods, but there's definitely a residual supply of fecal material in these bridges from bats. Uh, these guys uh, emerge again after dark, soon after dark. You see them leaving, and they go out and forage through the night. They may come back once or twice. Uh, they can go out to about 50 miles, and uh, they're insectivores. They, or they eat a whole lot of insects, which is their big beneficial use to humans. 
Um, and then they hang around all day sleeping in their, their roosts. And uh, they also are annually active. During the uh, winter they tend to migrate off somewhere or they hibernate locally. They're very inactive. Mostly during December through February. Um, some estimates of bats here in Austin. Uh, you know, there's been estimates of up to 1.5 million bats here in the, this colony. Uh, don't really know, but I've seen numbers. They've posted, and they say anywhere from 250 to 300,000 at this particular colony. Um, very limited data. Uh, at least the time we were doing this report. There was some uh, work that Steve Austin did, and I didn't really see a strong uh, signal from the bat colony. Um, State of California did see some issues at a particular site they were working at. Uh, let me just quickly show you these. Are the, this is the bat colony here. This is the sites that we, uh, this is a gauge here. Uh, this is really further down, but we also have a, 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 a CRP monitoring site. And these are the sites that we monitored. The main thing is site two is right underneath the bridge. 3A and 3B were downstream, so it was four. Site one was above. Uh, and we did some sampling during August and September of 08 and into uh, spring of 09 uh, to five ambient monitoring events. Uh, we also collected some fecal pellets for the genetic studies. And um, so anyway. Uh, this is based on historical data at the two sites I mentioned, uh, at the Sabine downstream site, and I should have this over here, but this is downstream of where the colony's at, and this is all the data for, I don't know how many years, I want to say about maybe 10 years, definitely more elevated. Again, this is wet weather, dry weather, just whatever's in the database that I got from HJC. Uh, there seems to be... Um, that's the historical data. In terms of the data that we, the data we collected, uh, we definitely saw, and this is uh, in terms of samples in the water, uh, a definite seasonal difference, and that is in the uh, summer months, uh, we tend to see in fall higher levels. Um, and in the spring, uh, we also saw higher levels as well at all sites. They, they pretty much trended together. Uh, one thing we did see is definite diurnal difference. That is, during the night um, at the bridge, uh, this is in, in the water, uh, we saw less, more in the daytime. But this was pretty consistent all through the, this area, both upstream uh, here and downstream as well, which is kind of interesting. Uh, well, Lo and behold, we found out after we're finished that there was other bat colonies. Uh, one was uh, upstream and was certainly a source and it, it, we, I didn't have an estimate on the density at the time we did this because the county guys found out about it. And there was one that was further downstream that was found underneath one of the bridges that had established itself. So we have additional bat colonies that previously weren't there or at least people hadn't seen them. Um, and so we did see this day-night difference, and um, we, we've kicked around a few ideas, and we think that that might be associated with some of the diurnal behavior of the bats. That is, during the day, they're sitting there and they're producing lots and lots of feces, and during the night, they're dispersed at other locations. Uh, this just shows you uh, the E. coli levels in terms of day and night. This is a little bit shortly um, after morning. This is you know, late in the afternoon. And again, you can see the, the definite difference. Uh, we did the DNA fingerprinting. Uh, let me just point out that um, we did have some association that appeared to be associated with the Wall Street Bridge. Uh, again, Dr. Um, uh, my colleague was, would be better to explain this to, uh, Dr. Brinkmeyer would be better to explain this to you, but we did see an indication that what bacteria we're picking up seem to be associated with the bats. Uh, let me see. They were telling me I'm out of time, so I need to move. Um, and this is just some of our intermediate calculations in terms of loading uh, and looking at daily loading in terms of E. coli based on 300,000 bats a uh, week and using various assumptions. Again, you can see this could be a very significant source of bacteria to the uh, bayou, you know, 600 something million. 
Uh, based on our data and literature, uh, again, and the fact that we're seeing even more bat colonies pop up here and there in these urban uh, systems, that uh, these are definitely a, a, a source we need to take into consideration. And also their dynamics in terms of being a diel source and a seasonal source, too. Uh, that is, they're gone during the, the winter and we see a drop in winter levels and in, in fall, late fall. And of course, you know, there's other factors associated with that too, temperature and so forth, but it's, it's pretty consistent. Um, and so, uh, let me just skip it here. And so, uh, again, more research is needed. And uh, again, we have a lot of other people uh, involved with this, a lot of students, uh, a lot of uh, uh, they've gone on to do other things. Uh, I didn't have enough time to throw a few bat pictures, but we had people, they weren't holding bats. <laughs> we're not supposed to mess with the bats, but we saw some dead bats and uh, fecal material and, and had some other pictures, but couldn't get them in time. So uh, I think that's it. Questions? Do you have time for one question? Did you guys see a difference in your fish uh, samples when uh, based on turbidity? Um, the short answer is no. Uh, I didn't. See, I mean, there's a lot of noise, and I think that within the range that we had, that it, I would be surprised if we did see something. We just, you know, we, we needed more conditions to sample over because, uh, again, for the most part, when we're shocking, we're at base flow. Okay, of course, turbidity is going to change as the flow comes up, and we're not going to be out there for safety reasons. Right, and I assume that if you did most of your electroshocking in the Houston area, you had a pretty, uh, your substrate would be uh, pretty much the same. Well, yeah, the, the one uh, closest to our school is, you know, real soft mud. It's, you know, and now uh, Wide Oak Bayou is a uh, definitely urban stream, too, and it has a clay bottom, but it has what I call pseudo clay. It's like hard pan, semi-concrete, weird substrate. It's highly eroded. And uh, so I, it's kind of different from all those others. And we also sample a little bit in concrete lined ditches there, too, a little bit further down. Well, I, I see some studies going up that basically show that the bacteria and is orders of magnitude higher than that one of Oh, yeah. Well, and again, we, what limited data we have, and again, uh, Again, what, in terms of what needs to be done is to look at that sediment biota connection because it seemed that that was tying in closer to what we were seeing with the fish versus the water column concentrations. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, Dr. Guillen brought up a, a really good point. You know, we focused most of our discussion this morning on really the the avian wildlife and then fish which is you know really kind of a new uh, thing to factor in in my mind but I think we're have some of the same struggles dealing with all of them the fecal production uh, issue I mean even in livestock cattle which have been studied extensively uh, I found studies that they produce anywhere from 60 to 140 pounds per day of manure and then the bacteria levels within that manure vary several orders of magnitude per gram so there's not good data out there especially when you get into the to the wildlife on how much they produce a day as well as there's not good data on you know how much bacteria is in a per gram of feces for each of these so that makes you know it very difficult for us to begin trying to nail down what the contributions from each of these wildlife sources are um, and then the density issue as well. I mean, determining wildlife densities, even for things as well studied as uh, white-tailed wild white, white deer. Um, you know, that is just such a huge struggle. With the, with the, the bats, that's particularly a problem because it's very difficult to sense the bats. Uh, there's techniques, but it's very specialized techniques because they're, they're, they're all, it's like trying to sample school fish. Mm -hmm. They're colonial and they're all clustered together I know I'm cutting into the break, but one last thing. Um, it seems like I remember a few years ago that, you know, really the, the bridge here in, in Austin with the bat colony, I thought there were a lot of 
departments of transportation coming in from other parts of the country to begin learning to design their bridges that way so they could develop um, and promote these colonies uh, in different areas around the country. Is that, did I hear correctly, Dr. Barrett, do you know? Or, I thought I'd heard that before. I mean, since, you know, they didn't mean to create habitat, but it did, and it was such a great colony that they were trying to do that elsewhere around the country. And so now, you know, we may be designing bridges that are contributing to bacteria. And then that goes back again to the issue, you know, what's, you know, What's more important, you know, having those colonies there and this, the great benefits that they provide to society or, you know, or these bacteria uh, contributions, you know, which weighs, weighs in the most. So, uh, Jay, you have one, something? Yeah, just one other thing I think is important because I've you know, covered these meetings before. I haven't really seen uh, bacteria except the autonomizer reservoir for uh, sources and, and most of the, the TMDL models and and, uh, and watershed planning models, we don't really look at sediment as a source of bacteria. We see it as everything's flowing into these rivers. Um, that's kind of a, an important point as we move forward that you know, these actually are sources of bacteria when we have runoff and resuspension in water. And we'll hit on that, I think, a little bit more later on today. Well, great presentations this morning. Um, once we get permissions from the, the presenters, we will try to put most of them online so you can go back and take a look at them and reference them as you're doing your work. A uh, very important thing about these meetings is the networking aspect. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, break for, uh, for now. Try to come back at 5 after. Uh, we'll go ahead and start a little bit late and try to catch up a little bit later.